But, but here's what, 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 what Paul found himself facing. And the question becomes, well, then how does he react? You know, what does he do with himself? How does he approach this beautifully built, morally decayed, spiritually dead center of civilization? What does he do here? And how does he make an impact? And maybe the question then becomes, well, what are we doing <laughs> in the culture in which we live? I'd live, like to give you five things just to consider uh, about Paul. The first two are found in verse 1, what Paul saw and what Paul felt. Verse 1 says of chapter 16, or no, verse 16. See, we got there to verse 16. Look, only 20 minutes and I'm already at the text. <laughs> verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. No doubt Paul walked around this huge place. If he could have went up the hill like you can today, up to the Acropolis, you could walk over to the Parthenon, exquisite buildings, amazing handiwork. There weren't any, you know, homes all built the same. Everything was one of a kind. Paul saw no beauty, however. He looked at life in Athens, and all he saw was spiritual adultery and spiritual idolatry. He, he was grieved by what he saw. He saw a city given over to idols. The, the word uh, given over to idols is only one word in Greek, but it literally means to be smothered by them, to be smothered by, by them. I, I think that the writer Xenophon it, it wrote of Athens that it was one great altar with one great sacrifice. Everywhere you turned, idol worship took place. It, it is what Paul saw with his Christian eye. And I think that somehow we as Christians need to go out into the world with a heavenly outlook, don't we? We can't get caught up in the temporal stuff, the things that are going on day in and day out. We do need to have a bigger picture and look at the world around us with spiritual eyes. And sometimes I think we miss the obvious while being enamored with, with the things that really shouldn't turn our heads at all. But, but Paul didn't get caught up in, in, in all that was going on. And he might have went, man, what a beautiful place. What, how smart these people are. And look, look at the advances in technology. And look at the advances in, in architecture. And look at the advances. And wow, we were, boy, Jerusalem should see this. He just went, oh, this is sad. And he came to a new place where his heart had always longed to go to new places. And, and, and what did he feel? He felt provoked or stirred within. The, the word uh, for provoked um, is a word in Greek that means to be angered or greatly distressed. If you find this word in the Septuagint, the Old Testament version in Greek, you will find it used almost exclusively of God's reaction to Israel's idolatry. Isaiah wrote, I've stretched out my hand all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that's not good, according to their own thoughts, who provoke me to anger continually, sacrificing in the garden, burning incense on the altars of brick. God's response was fury. It is the same word that Paul, or Luke, I should say, describes Paul's response to what he saw. It angered him. It, it distressed him. It, it is what Paul felt within his heart. You know, sometimes the word is translated jealousy, this word provoked. Um, you shall worship no other gods, for the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God. That word jealous is the same word for provoked here. Jealousy is, is by definition the resentment of rivals, and they can be good or bad. Jealousy can be good or bad, depending on if the rival has any business being a rival. Let me try to clear that up. Um, if you're jealous of somebody's success, or their fame, or their looks, if you will, that's sin because you have no monopoly on those kind of things. You may or you may not have them. That's up to the Lord. If you are jealous over your spouse's affection, that's a good jealousy because there should be no rival. And that is the way that the Lord uses it here when he speaks about idolatry. He has rivals and he shouldn't have any. He's the Lord. And yet everywhere Paul looked, he saw people rivaling the love of God by worshiping these false gods. And so it, wasn't, it was a, a jealousy of God that was good in the sense that he required and demanded and wanted the love of man solely for himself. And, and Paul just was moved by that. You know, God is jealous of your love and devotion. He, he wants exclusive allegiance.